To master a game, you need a plan. And a good place to start is to find how many different places you might have to use it. For simple games, the number starts small. But as the games add pieces and places they can go, its amount of situations and its difficulty to master skyrockets. The further games are on this list, the closer making a computer that plays it at a human level comes to the limits of what we can build. But you know what we're here for. So where's Pokemon? Oh, wait a minute, that's not right. That number seems too small. Oh, okay, that's just for turn one. That does make more sense, but if we had the graph show the number for every turn, well, this happens. Despite its worldwide popularity, surprisingly few people know that underneath the veil of a kid's game, Pokemon is one of the most complex two-player strategy games out there. And with this complexity, building a computer that can not only outplay humans, let alone those who've played competitively for over a decade, sounds impossible, right? I don't think so. I don't think so. Hi, and welcome to the third build. Today is about my journey in creating Future Sight AI, a computer program that learns how to play Pokemon like a human and at a competitive level. This will not only cover the main steps in how I made it, but also how well it did, what its next plans are, and how you can battle it yourself. So let me start by clarifying that intro and tell you what goes into playing competitive Pokemon. Most of you will know Pokemon as a game where you go around catching fun creatures. However, the purpose of all this catching is for your caught Pokemon to participate in battles where you and your opponent send out Pokemon to face off. Each turn, you choose one of four different moves or switch between one of your six team members with the goal of bringing the health of your opponent's team to zero. Where the complexity comes into play is in what those move and switch options can do and how many options you have for those options. For example, let's take our four moves. Each can be one of 18 different types that come in their own web of strengths and weaknesses and can do a combination of effects like doing damage, healing yourself, poisoning your target, changing the weather, and so much more. But before you can pick from any of those moves, you have to choose them from a list of about 40 useful ones each Mon can learn. Looking at this information alone, this Mon already has a total of almost 100,000 different ways you can use it. Or more importantly, it can be used against you. And again, that number only represents picking moves. If I explained all the options of choosing your team members, all of their stats, or even the stats of their stats, you'd start to see that that number for how many ways a battle can start might feel like an understatement. So that whole explanation said, I want to let y'all know that you might feel like there are some over or under explained topics throughout the video. And that comes from my guess that the people watching this at least when it comes to Pokemon, will be those who know nothing or those who know everything. And then amongst all my viewers, pretty much no one who has a lot of AI experience, myself included. So <laughs> please bear with me because I'm going to try my hardest to explain it all to best fit you. And because things still might get confusing, I want to try something new. If a question comes to your mind about anything I talk about, go ahead and write it down somewhere I'll see it. Best place, the comment section. And if I get more than a dozen or so, on the Friday of the week I'm releasing this, I'll put out a follow-up video where I answer some of those questions. And for all two pro data scientists watching this, go ahead and take out a large sheet of paper because uh, you're gonna need all that space to keep track of all the things I might have done wrong. But that's okay, because this is my first real data science project and I'm here for the feedback. Just don't be pretentious. I don't have patience for that. All right, that's enough intro. Let's just dive in to how Future Sight AI works. There are three major jobs that this AI must pull off to be effective. Number one, understand whether it's winning. Number two, predict how its choices will play out. And number three, determine what it's not told about the opponent's team. We're gonna start with the one that this project only started because and could not be done without. This project only started because of my interest in the NBA. I noticed that websites would post a team's current chance of winning during games, and I wanted to know how they were making those predictions. So I figured that the best way to understand it was to try making my own. Once I got a little bit into that project, it occurred to me that a sporting event and a Pokemon battle couldn't be all that different from a data perspective. So I tried making predictions for this game too. So it turns out that finding the chance to win of a basketball game is relatively straightforward as it mostly comes down to the current score and how much time is left. However, 
Pokemon doesn't have any concrete indicators for your chance to win, since if you used your current health, for example, as your substitute for a score, well, anyone who's played the game can tell you that just because you have more HP than your opponent does not guarantee that you're going to win. That means in order to do this, I had to figure out how a bunch of different factors relate to how well you're doing in a battle. And the go-to place for solving a problem like this nowadays is machine learning. The reason machine learning is great for an application like this is once you have a machine learning model set up, it can sort out hard to solve problems for you. This works since you can give it a set of factors you think are part of the answer. The model can figure out how important each factor is or how to interpret them, and then it will give you an answer by using that importance to put those factors together. As a starting point, I decided that these were the attributes that could be useful in determining a player's likelihood of winning. The Pokemon fans out there might be wondering why ideas like each Pokemon's type or their ability aren't factored in, and that's because at the time, I thought those factors didn't change too much for a particular Pokemon, that just knowing which Pokemon it was would do a good enough job in representing those ideas. For creating the model, I decided to use TensorFlow. I'd already planned on doing the entire project in JavaScript, and since you could access TensorFlow's entire library of machine learning tools directly from that language, it was a perfect fit. And to my fellow programmer out there who's about to write a comment about why I shouldn't have used JavaScript for X, Y, and Z reason, yes, I know, you're right. I found out the hard way. It's just, I didn't have much of a choice in the language I used, and I'll get to why in a moment. The biggest requirement for creating most machine learning models is having a bunch of examples of the data that you're going to put into it where the answer you're looking for is already known so it can figure out how those factors relate to that answer. So for me, that means I have to somehow find tons of different battles where I know the teams of both players can see exactly what happened on every turn and know the answer of who won. So enter Pokemon Showdown a fan-made simulator where people can play competitive Pokemon against each other and, most importantly, save their finished battles to the website to be viewed by anyone later. This means I potentially had a source of thousands of daily examples that had all the details I was looking for. All I had to do was figure out a way to get all those battles and put them into a format that TensorFlow can understand. At first, this meant me manually running a program to download all the battles on their public server on a daily basis. But when someone on their team noticed my project, they decided to provide me with 2 million battles to train on, which was way more than enough to get the job done. So big shout out to them for helping me out there. I then trained the model so every turn of the battle was a separate example, with their answer being whether player one ended up winning. And in the end, I had made a model that could predict correctly who would win from any given turn with at most 81% accuracy. I haven't yet mentioned it just how much randomness can turn the tide of these battles? Like when a really strong move that won't always hit misses. So getting this right 100% of the time is impossible, which makes that accuracy near the upper limit of what's reasonable. Now, because of how I structured my code, I realized it was only a few modifications away from creating models that could help predict your opponent's next move. It really just took switching out the answer from being whether player one would win to what player one would do in the next turn and in the end, I was able to create three models that represent the different aspects of what a player can do each turn with even greater accuracy than before. Getting these models to this accuracy was a project onto itself. So I decided to release these predictions as something you can use. If you go to your web browser's app extension store and look up Pokemon Battle Predictor, you'll find a free extension that I made, which I admittedly don't update as often as I should, which enables you to view the predictions these models make for the battle that you're playing or just watching live. It works for most singles formats and you can find more information about it in the description. That's it for predictions. So it's on to step two. This step is where Future Sight AI gets its name, as it's all about looking at how a battle might play out when the AI makes its next move. The basic steps of this are figuring out what move options you and your opponent can choose, seeing what happens on all the different combinations of those move choices, and choosing the move that led to the most situations that were favorable to you. Something I didn't realize when I started was that this method of looking at possible turns to figure out your most favorable move is the same one used by the best chess played AIs. And because my machine learning model can tell you which of those future turns give you a better chance to win, that same method can now be applied to Pokemon. There are some differences that make it more difficult to be applied here, but the two main ones are you don't know what your opponent's moves are for sure, and this game's random chance. 
Let's see how those affect this diagram from earlier, which represents the first turn of a battle. This chart for the turns that result from the move combinations of both players is already a best case scenario, assuming you know everything your opponent can do, which won't happen all that often. So if you want to cover all their possible moves, the opponent's side of this graph gets much larger. What this chart also assumes is every move always happens the same way, but in reality, a ton of moves have a chance to miss or burn its target or just other random side effects, and each one of those creates another turn to consider. And don't forget, all these situations are just for one turn, and to look into future turns, you'd have to explore at least this many options for all the turns that branch off from this first one. If you've played the game, you might be thinking, yeah, that is a huge number, but I don't consider nearly that many options when I play. And you're right. But the thing is, you can do that because you've spent time learning what's common and what small fraction of that huge number you actually have to worry about. Getting a computer to understand what you know intuitively is the tricky part of all of this. But that's where the machine learning comes into play. Let's take another look at that graph. Since we have models that can tell us the most likely moves our opponent will go for, we can remove the less likely ones. Also, because we can know our chance of winning for any situation, we can remove our own moves which result in way worse outcomes than the others. When you add in limits for how likely a random event must be to be worth considering, the AI can reduce how many turns it must explore several times over. But how do you explore a battle's future? Well, Pokemon Showdown is useful for that too as the code to run their battle simulator is available for anyone to use. With a few modifications to the JavaScript code, so that way it creates a split path at those random chances, and I can explore any turn. And this is why I had to use JavaScript, as it's the language the entire battle simulator is written in. And to spare myself the absolute headache of writing a fast program that can run between two different coding languages, I figured I just needed to pick one and take it all the way. So it was either choose JavaScript and sacrifice some performance, or choose a different language and rewrite an entire battle system that took almost a decade to get to where it is today. Also, I just like JavaScript, especially a million times more than the language I can only guess you were going to suggest. So yeah, it was a pretty easy choice. Thankfully, exploring different outcomes of a turn doesn't need to happen in a certain order. So, if I can process multiple at the same time, the AI could get its results way faster. That method speed advantage was so great that it left me no choice but to bite the bullet and make my project multi-threaded, allowing it to run turn exploring on multiple processors. And yes, coders, that does mean that this is a multi-threaded JavaScript only program. Please, just roll with it. My laptop, which was the computer the AI mainly ran on, has eight processing cores it could use to explore turns. That's enough to make it faster, but using only that many meant I was lucky to get through exploring one turn ahead before time ran out. When I started looking at ways to increase the number of processors I could run on, I realized that my best, if not only, solution was taking the AI to the cloud. This solution had me super excited since a cloud server can have pretty much any number of cores between 32, 64, 256, you name it, a cloud server can handle it. But that excitement disappeared when I found out I was limited to only 16 cores. Don't get me wrong, doubling from what I had is still good, but compared to what it could have been, it's a little disappointing. Like I was so ready to just rock out with a 64 core computer and just run house. But alas, for right now, because of the limitations, the AI can only look just shy of three turns ahead in its 15 second time limit, which is fine for its first run. Speaking about the first run, let's talk about how it did. I wanna show you something I don't even think some of the most dedicated users of Showdown have seen before. When you play against a random opponent in Showdown, you're given a rating based upon how well you've done against other opponents. This is a graph of how many people have each of those ratings. Now this system does have its flaws as people's ratings tend to fluctuate quite a bit, but I was able to mitigate that by not only making sure it played plenty of games, but also playing enough games until its rating became stable. As for how I got this information, because I had that system set up to download battles off of Showdown on a daily basis, I found myself with a mini database of all of Showdown's battles. This graph clearly won't reflect every battle, 
but this does represent 50,000 battles in the past month, so this should be more than enough to make a good estimate. For our analysis, I'm going to add this line to the graph, which represents what percent of player you are when you're at that rating. I want to drop down a couple of points to give people perspective. So the first one is where the average player is. Now the second two points of context I want to give are the average rating and the maximum ever rating of the AI's creator. So, me. So, about that, um, I'm actually not that good at this game. Even despite playing it for the better part of the past 10 years and knowing way too much about how this game works, I'm just not good at applying it. At least I'm better than the rating you get if you only pick random moves. Another point of contact I want to give you is from Showdown itself, as they do publish some of this information, but only for the top 500 players in the world. And as I'm recording this, this is the rating of player 500. So now for the AI. So the AI's average rating was 1547, and its maximum rating was 1630. That average rating puts it in the top 10% of all players, and that maximum rating puts it above the top 5% of all players. Okay, so presenter version of me off for a second. I, I gotta be real with y'all. I truly never believed that the AI would ever get that far. Like just two months ago, I was telling myself that the 1400s was the highest I would ever expect it to get. But when I saw it just storm past my expectations, yeah, I just, I still can't really wrap my head around it. And the thing about it getting to 1630, that means it was very close to being in the top 500 in the world. And the AI entering the 1600s is not even an anomaly, as that rating came two weeks ago, but then when I ran this yesterday, it got back to the 1600s no problem. Now I do want to clarify that just because it has that rating does not mean it's going to play well every time, because there are still some pretty big gaps in this logic and two fundamental parts still holding it back. Now the first of the two, and this is truly a topic onto itself that I'll have to save for later, is that the AI builds its own teams. In short, it does so by trying to build a well-rounded team that counters the Pokemon it thinks it will see more often, while also not being countered itself. And for right now, I have it playing really safe. Like, it could pick whatever Pokemon it wants, but their sets don't really deviate that far off of what's standard, since I'd rather just have all its teams be fine rather than risk making any bad ones. Now the second part is a little bit more complicated. Since I knew the AI would be playing against people in a bunch of different skill levels while trying to raise its own rating, I had to program in a way to make it play differently against those of different rank because you can't approach different player levels at the same way and expect to win. And this might be a byproduct of how I set up its runs, but it seems like this programming had an unintended consequence. So one would expect that the AI would win more against worse players and lose more against better ones, but when I looked at its wins and losses when they were grouped by player ranking, it seemed like they were all very close to 50%. So I guess that means it played to its opponent's skill level, which I guess is useful in its own right, but I would have preferred if it, you know, played better. I feel like with just a little bit of an adjustment, I can get it out of this state, but for now, it has this weird limitation. And now it's time for part three, which is here because someone had weather ball. Hi, future me here. So I realized while editing that this next section was a five minute long super tangent. All you gotta know is that I saw a super impressive play and realized that there were a lot of parts missing if the AI was gonna come anywhere close to making that play itself. There's a link to that play and everything else I've referenced in the description. This made me realize I was hardly addressing a crucial part of playing this game well. And in order to fix that, I had to go deep down the path of discovering just how much information about your opponent's team you can learn without being directly told. And the first step in doing that was inverse damage calculation. That's a term I made up to describe finding your opponent's stats based upon the amount of damage you do to each other, but it's best explained through an example. So here's a situation where our opponent does damage on us. When you click a damaging move in Pokemon, the amount of damage done is determined by this equation, with the main components being the power of the move, the user's attack and level, and its target's defenses. We only run inverse damage calculation once the damage has already been done, so we can rearrange the equation to find the attack stat which caused this damage. Since the game tells us our opponent's level, we know our own defense stat, and the power of the move that hit us can be looked up, there's only one more number we need to correctly find their attack stat. 
However, that number is where things get complicated. It represents the general damage modifier, which is a product of potentially dozens of known and unknown effects happening during a battle, which can change how much damage a move can do. And the two effects that can have the greatest difference, yet we have the least likelihood of knowing, are from the item the attacker is holding or their special ability. There are a ton of different items and some abilities which can affect how much damage an attack can do, which could make sorting through which ones they currently have a tedious process. But if we can combine the knowledge of how much each of them modify damage with what the opponent's Pokemon most commonly has, then we can efficiently find the most likely combination of their item and ability which makes this equation return the Pokemon's possible stat. Now I know I don't need an exact stat, and an estimate will probably work just fine, but the thing is, the computer just needs to make so many other guesses that I just can't miss an opportunity to know something for sure. This is by no means an exact science, and there's a ton more work that can go on here, but it already more than exceeds my expectations, so it's good for now. I could really talk about this code forever, because it felt like for every five lines of code, I could have added a whole page to the script. And considering that there's almost 20,000 lines in here, there's so much more I just should have talked about. Like, I didn't even cover how it actually plays the game. So I am definitely making this an ongoing series on this channel. And it might not be every video, but expect this AI to stick around. And I recommend you do as well. So I know I said that there were three tasks that make this AI work. Well, there's actually a fourth. And I'm gonna tell you what it is, but how it works will have to come later as I only recently finished it. And it's gonna take me some time to put it into coherent words. So consider this, all three parts I've mentioned exist just to help the AI look through thousands of future turns. And although that is an effective strategy, I couldn't help but think that there must be a more efficient way. So while I was writing code to help the AI get more out of fewer turns, I realized that if I changed it a bit, it could also be used to help guide the machine learning predictions. Once I tested that, I realized that this guiding code on its own outperformed the machine learning models, both in accuracy and even more so in speed. It was such an improvement, in fact, that the AI in its current state doesn't use machine learning at all. I'm still not too sure how I feel about that, but because of this fourth phase, the AI was able to go from doing well because it could think ahead to doing great because it could think sideways. Uh. Did I really just call the new center of the program thinking sideways? Well, that's why we're doing this later. In the meantime, how would you like to battle it yourself? For the week of this video being uploaded, Future Sight AI is open for challenges. All you have to do is go to Pokemon Showdown, type in this username, have a team ready in one of these formats, and get ready to see what it's made of firsthand. Also, if you're not the battling type, I've set up a live stream of sorts on my website where you can watch its current battle and see the predictions it's making. Also, it should be noted that it's gonna be running at its absolute weakest performance setting, which still should be fine, but I get if that's disappointing. It's just, that's just how it has to be. Cause if I had this running at full strength for a full week, the only thing this AI would be beating is my wallet. But if you're really interested in battling it at its peak, just hit me up and we'll see if we can make something work. That being said, I do have every intention in making the AI play on the official games on Switch, as it should be pretty straightforward as long as a computer can read the screen, so I can guarantee that's something coming in the AI's future. But speaking about the AI's future, there are two questions I feel like are gonna be pretty common that I just wanna address right now. Number one, no. Unlike my past projects, I will not be releasing the code for this. If the past however many minutes have shown you anything about me, one of them should be that I care deeply about this game's competitive scene. And I feel like if I release the code to just let anyone use it, that could be opening up the Pandora's box of people using this AI to like cheat in tournaments or clog up the server, just a whole bunch of other mess. Similar to how I bundled the machine learning models into the battle predictor, I do want to release some of the other tools that it uses, like the inverse damage calculator, because I do want the community to get something out of this. But yeah, the code, it stays with me. And number two, yes, doubles is coming. 
For those who don't know, the format of the tournaments hosted by Pokemon themselves is for battles where instead of having one Pokemon out per side, there's two. And although that does complicate a lot of things, I am still so ready to tackle that side of the project. Because I tried to keep doubles in mind throughout the entire coding process, and I have most of the ideas about how to implement it worked out. And really, the only thing stopping me is it's just gonna take some time. Because at the end of the day, I am just one guy working on this. Well, for now. But hopefully talking about that is what Friday's for. As for my other plans, I do have some fun things in mind, like I really want to see how well this can play through a story of one of the main games, and then of course, there is no shortage of Pokemon challenges I could apply this to. But I have my sights on a particular problem that I would like to solve once and for all. There is a popular quote amongst Pokemon fans that, frankly, I believe applies to life in general. That paraphrasing says that if you are truly skilled, you can win with your favorites. There's already been some truly skilled people who've tried to be the proof of this on both sides of the argument, but their successes or failures were never going to make this definitive. And that just comes down to always not knowing who's the weakest link. However, a computer that can not only keep its play consistent, but consistently good, fixes all these problems. And with a little more coding, this AI could also be applied to find the best possible set for a particular team. And with all that in mind, I think this might be our best chance of seeing this through. As for what team to use, well, I think I have an idea. Because over the decade of playing this game, I've had some time to develop a pretty concrete idea of the team of six I'd want to put up to a task like this. They aren't all my favorites, but collectively, they make up my favorite team. In its current state, Future Sight AI isn't ready to do this question justice. But one day, when I'm ready, they'll get their time to shine. But for now, don't forget that you can battle or watch the AI throughout the week, come back on Friday to get your questions answered, and until then, I'll see you later.